dream of the internet is universal access to all knowledge. Can we make the Library of Alexandria version two? Can we make it so that anybody curious enough to want to have access to information from anything, anything, books, music, video, web pages, can we make it so that they can have access to it at any time, anywhere in the world? The answer is absolutely yes. We're not quite there yet with the internet, but we're getting closer. And the Internet Archive is trying to play a role toward building that world. These machines is about five petabytes of the primary copy of the Internet Archive. I've been designing supercomputers my whole career. And what's different about these is the lights actually mean something. Every time a light blinks, is somebody uploading something or downloading something from the Internet Archive. We get about four million people using the Internet Archive resources every day. If anybody's reading one of those books anywhere in the world, it glows. The Internet Archive and art are kind of infused in each other. I look to artists to help me understand what it is we're trying to build, and they've built all sorts of things that are all through the Internet Archive, just to try to understand, like, what's the metaphors, or what are we trying to do here? Artists tend to look a step out and reconceptualize things. Where artists, engineers like myself think of what's possible, there's a little bit more of what should we be building. The Internet Archive plays with old and new. Internet Archive, right? And we're in this uh, old church, but it's new again. Um, it's, it's got a physical presence to something essentially virtual, which is the Internet. So playing with these sort of contrasts and trying to help people understand what the world that we're building is. Yeah, it's bits, but it's things that you can understand. There's servers you can look at. There are programmers that are approachable. This is built by people for people. Let's make that all exposed in a way that we understand this digital future we're building and have it be a conversation, not a fit complete by some VC-funded, anonymous group of programmers who knows where. That's the Internet Archive. What we need are artists now to go and help us understand this digital wave. People are extremely nervous. Artists see things out a generation or two and can help us relate to not only what are we going through, but where should we be going? Science fiction writers, um, painters, musicians, all can play a role in helping figure out where should we go? Because right now, I think we're just stumbling forward with whatever is profitable. That ain't no way to run a culture. I, we need artists to help us envision the future we want to live in, and then we can build it. My name is Taravat Talapasand, and I live and work in San Francisco, where I primarily work with painting, great drawings, installations, sculptures, neons, everything. The main point of my work really is the conceptual narratives that I'm creating that deals with being a woman of Iranian descent, but being raised in America. During my residency at the Internet Archive, I focused on collaborating with a dear friend of mine, Hushidar Mortazai and his father, Vali Mortazai, in which we had scanned all the periodicals that we had selected, propaganda magazines, articles, images, things that have really been lost, um, but had luckily been collected by his father. His father had passed away a couple of years ago. And so we really want to allow people from all over the world to access this information. And I'm really excited to be working with the Internet Archive because this is probably the most political that I've actually been able to include in my work, working with these magazines and these periodicals predating from the revolution in Iran up to 1984. So all of this information is finally being archived and I'm being able to kind of commemorate it um, and who it comes from in this work, in this exhibition. I am basically collaging and picking, choosing selection of images primarily involving women because that's what my work really focuses on, female empowerment. Working with graphite drawings, working with pigmented color and having them all framed in these 
um, mosaic handmade Esfahani frames that are quite old and actually made during um, the regime in the early 80s. During this exhibition, I will be returning to Iran. It's been 11 years. I'm very excited to have this exhibition while I'm in Iran because this residency has inspired me to continue to collect and archive such information. We are at a very tense, um, heated time between US and Iran. So to be there at that time, I think is really important to collect what is happening now, to come back and to bring that into the work and bring that into a, a public. I really have dedicated my life to where my family, where I come from, and the woman that I've become in both a conglomerate, equal yet irreconcilable differences between the US and Iran. Uh, so we shall see what's to happen, but these works will forever live on. Part of my art process is that Sometimes I will have an idea and I just have a concept and I just elaborate on it and I find the right forms to support that concept and I just think of the most absurd ideas I can come up with. The other way in which I work in tangent with that is working with found material. So I might find something like either on the street, online or in the trash and get an idea from that and it generates a concept from this, the material that I find. For the Internet Archive Residency, like in the past, I made a documentary film called Sea Red Blue Jay on my family. And what I needed to do is I needed to have archival footage that would support the film. So I used a lot of footage from the Internet Archive. I also had done a panel at Evergold Projects coinciding with the SF MoMA, talking about how to preserve your videos, trying to keep something alive that's a digital format and to also allow it to be shared. You know, the absurdity of that task to try to do that has kind of informed um, me to look back at other ways of preserving things. I immediately went back to thinking about pickling or salting meats and how do you physically pickle data to capture you know, their energy inside of these jars in some way and in terms of a preservation. And then other things I'm thinking about is also so like, what is the internet? <laughs> I think about as being this way that everyone's intersecting, but it's also coming out of different tests and things of the military industrial complex. Not unlike ACID or LSD is like a similar thing in terms of it being used by government and then this thing being distributed back amongst the people again. There's a blurring between psychedelics and cannabis and how these all intersect within the internet in some way in terms of extending the life of oneself, extending your mind and also allowing yourself to expand into space but also have longevity in some way. One other piece I'm interested in is also a series of heads called dead heads and a series of headphones are all on these dead heads and in the internet archives live recordings of the dead are being streamed live to them. And I like that as like a really interesting conundrum of, you know, playing a band who is no longer in existence physically, but is preserved from a moment of documentation live to then just give it life to another audience in some way. And, you know, through life and death is the same thing in which pickling is too, preserving things it's the breakdown of one kind of matter that's then giving life to something again through its decomposition. For the show, I use all this sort of like old world erotica, um, mostly from like Northern Europe, to make an erotic garden. I took a Facebook quiz uh, that was called What Abomination from the Garden of Earthly Delights. It was just like very hilarious <laughs> and I guess it made me want to make some art that was funny. One of the reasons that I chose this old world erotica was because the I think on the internet the like sex that people are used to seeing is all pornography. The bodies are really unreal, exaggerated, but the bodies in the old world like uh, lithographs 
you know, I think even like a lot of the models for women were men and the bodies are just much more realistic. They're much more androgynous. They're much closer, I think, to how bodies actually are. So that was the huge appeal of using that as my source material. A couple things happen when you, when you replace the head of a person with a flower or a plant. The first thing is that it's, there's a humor, it's funny, where you're distorting a body, the hybrid, like sort of monstrosity of it. The other thing that happens is that you anonymize the person whose head you've replaced. The body becomes objectified. But I also think there's something freeing in being objectified, in sort of admitting that we're just bodies and organisms and not that different from plants in some ways. I think what spoke to me was the creative freedom of the creatures and how they seem to tap into something very uh, subconscious. And so I think like sort of sex and humor are very connected in this way where they seem to spring directly from the subconscious. Like you, no one can force you to laugh and no one can force you to be attracted to someone. So I borrowed several books from the archive and I would take uh, screenshots of different sort of uh, reproductions of etchings and lithographs that spoke to me. Then I would find images of fruit from different like botanical illustrations on the archive. And that material isn't really available at libraries. It's even hard to find on the internet. I couldn't really find it on the internet. The only place I could find it on was the internet archive. Thank you.